Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Cole, President and CEO of the Greater Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the Chamber's annual meeting, featuring a timely discussion entitled The Way Back to Health and Work. We're happy to have 300 Chamber members on the call today and partners. So welcome all of you. We wish circumstances allowed us to be meeting in person today, as we each year do throughout the Chamber's 100-year history. But these are extraordinary times, and we're happy to be together virtually instead. True to form, we're bringing you an informative presentation with national experts about the most important change of our time, recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. But before we do that, I want to welcome the chairman of the Chamber's Board of Directors to this for this current year. He's been hard at work since July, leading our board. As is customary at our annual meeting, we introduce our board chairman to the community and provide a brief snapshot of the work the Chamber is engaged in. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, Terry. Thank you. Good to see you. Kyle Beasley is this year's board chair, and we're pleased to have his steady hand at the helm of our organization as we, the business community, wade through the rough waters of the pandemic. Kyle is senior vice president at Bank of Albuquerque, where he's worked for 17 years. He oversees commercial lending and has chaired several community organizations, including United Way, the Lobo Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. He's a graduate of both SMU and Texas A&M in banking, accounting, and finance. Kyle has two grown daughters with his wife, Sherry, and enjoys fly fishing, golf, and mountain biking, all of which, might I add, are pretty good socially distanced activities. Kyle takes over for Mike Canfield. We can't say enough about Mike's kindness and vision, and we're thankful for the strong leadership and support he gave the chamber during his time as chair. Kyle, it wasn't how you drew it up. Welcome to the chamber chair position. Here's a pandemic. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. And you're right. It's uh, uh, not how I drew it up. These are very unusual and not ideal uh, circumstances and very difficult for businesses and families across Albuquerque. But I am truly honored to uh, chair such an influential organization in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, we are strong advocates for business, whether there's a pandemic going on or, or not, and we're actually uh, continue to do very important work at the Chamber. Of course, it's a team effort. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Chamber's ex executive uh, committee this year. Uh, you can see them on your screen. Uh, these are very strong ambassadors and leaders for our business community. And I'll make a special note of the gentleman in the top left-hand corner, uh, Norm Becker. He's CEO of New Mexico Mutual, and he's our chair elect and will take over as board chair uh, next July. Uh, and I also want to recognize the companies and organizations who have sponsored today's meeting. Uh, PM Resources and CEO Pat Vincent Kalan, New Mexico Mutual and CEO Norm Becker. Bank of Albuquerque, represented uh, by myself and our uh, market CEO, Jennifer Thomas. The University of New Mexico and its president, Garnett Stokes, including uh, UNM Health Sciences Center, UNM Health, UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center, and UNM Athletics. Western Sky Community Center and CEO, Tony Hernandez. Central New Mexico Community College and its president, Tracy Hartzler. Molina Healthcare and Executive VP of Policy and Government Affairs, Carolyn Ingram. Presbyterian Healthcare Services and CEO, Dale Maxwell. Excellent Schools New Mexico and its Executive Director, Scott Heinemann. Albertson's Market, Vice President of the Albuquerque Region, Travis Cheney. Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Mexico, CEO, Kurt Shipley. Comcast, Vice President, Chris Duncanson. Sandia Laboratory Federal Credit Union, CEO Robert Chavez. True Health New Mexico, President, CEO, uh, President and CEO Mark Epstein. Jane's Corporation, Chairman and CEO Rick Marquardt. Pattern Energy, CEO Michael Garland. U.S. Bank, Regional President Paul DePaula. 
Bohannon Houston, President and CEO Bruce Stidworthy, KPMG uh, uh, Managing Partner Fred Winter, General Mills, Albuquerque Plant Manager Isabel Capones, Payday HCM, President Mike Stanford, Loveless Biomedical, President and CEO Bob Rubin, and New Mexico Bank and Trust, CEO Greg Leyendecker. Thank you all for your generosity and engagement. Very, very much appreciated in these difficult times. Uh, these companies and organizations believe like I do in the need for an effective and aggressive chamber in Albuquerque, a chamber that is invested in making our community stronger and better. Okay, thanks to our sponsors. We've put our mission statement for the chamber on the screen and, and we do take it very seriously. We are working to grow our economy, and our goal is to make our city and our state a great place to start and grow a business and a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Greater Albuquerque no longer just defines the region of the state we represent. It also describes the purpose of our work each day. Terry, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Kyle. We are indeed a community-minded organization. Our interests are not narrow or parochial. As a chamber, we work to put business community at the table to solve the most pressing challenges we face in our city and state. Working with others and alongside government, we want to amplify our community's assets and knock down barriers to growth. We absolutely believe that when our businesses grow, our community is better off. A rising tide truly does lift all boats. We focus on two things, advocacy and connections. We provide a powerful and necessary voice for businesses at all levels of government. We're there because so many businesses can't be. Our advocacy work takes many different forms and spans a range of issues that impact economic growth. We're in the news, writing op-eds, testifying at hearings, negotiating legislation, identifying best practices elsewhere, and bringing them here, and drafting letters to express the position of the business community on important issues. And we're a connecting organization, helping businesses connect with government officials, our agencies, and with other businesses. We also connect businesses to important resources such as news and information you can't get anywhere else, meeting space, leadership training for senior professionals. Kyle, do you want to talk a little about our bigs now? Sure, Terry. Uh, for anyone who has followed the Chamber's work, you know that we focus on addressing three major challenges to long-term economic growth in New Mexico. Uh, we call those our, our bold issue groups or bigs, uh, and they are crime and pub public safety, education reform, and downtown transformation. If we can improve the academic performance of our kids, create safer communities for people to live and work in, and build a vibrant downtown, uh, we believe our city and state will thrive, businesses will grow, jobs will be added, and wages will rise. Let's take the first one. With respect to public safety, we're working to drive crime rates down. They continue to be at historic highs, as we all know, especially for violent crime, and this impacts business. We need to take a, a more, we need a more efficient justice system that uses data and technology to identify and take down serious offenders and criminal networks. And to deter crime, research shows that those who commit crimes in our community must face swift and certain punishment. Kyle, to those points, we're making some good progress. Three years ago, we helped bring a high-tech crime strategies unit to the DA's office. And I'm happy to say we secured permanent funding for it during this last legislature. We successfully secured tougher crime laws for guns, increasing penalties for those who use a firearm in the commission of a crime or possess a firearm illegally. And we've helped the city and APD secure millions of new funding for technology like license place readers. The chamber also competed for and won a $1.2 million grant from the De Department of Justice. We believe we're the first chamber in the country to win a grant like this. Our team is leading an effort to develop two crime fighting tools that will help officers and prosecutors alike more easily and quickly compile evidence, 
launch cases and hold um, offenders accountable. We do have a long way to go, but we're making important systemic improvements, especially with respect to prosecution, and they are helping. Yes, they are. And that, that grant that you mentioned is a big deal, Terry. I know that uh, we're going to uh, keep pushing to tighten up our pretrial detention rules, support diversion programs that work, add more officers to our streets, and encourage local collaborations with federal law enforcement. On the education front, uh, we've focused our efforts on trying to raise the achievement of our students uh, for their sake and for the long-term health of our economy. We believe that every child can learn and improve academically, regardless of their background. And it doesn't uh, cut it when just three in, two, in 10 students read on grade level and one in four do not graduate. We need to start earlier with proven early childhood programs that can close achievement gaps that form before children even enter kindergarten. And every family must have the ability to find a great public school option for their child. That's right, Kyle. And that's why we were one of the first and certainly the largest organization to endorse the creation of a new early childhood department to better coordinate early childhood programs, improve oversight, develop early child workforce, and require these programs to get results. We also then worked to create a new early childhood endowment fund to responsibly expand these programs over time. And we strongly support the development and growth of charter schools. We've had the pleasure of working with six different high quality charter schools in Albuquerque to help them launch and expand. And these schools, which serve largely low income and minority student populations are getting tremendous academic results for their kids. We'll continue to push for transparent and strong accountability systems that help identify the struggling students, schools, and teachers. And we do believe that our children need to get back into the classroom where they can learn the best as soon as possible. And finally, we're working to build a vibrant downtown where people want to live, businesses want to locate, and residents and visitors are able to have exciting and fun experiences. To do this, we need to address downtown homelessness and crime, which can impede growth, uh, while at the same time investing in game-changing development projects that will increase the appeal of downtown, pull new people into the area, and broaden how downtown is used. That's why we've helped secure over $12 million in funding to bring new life to the historic rail yards, a tremendous anchor asset uh, to downtown. Just imagine how exciting it it will one day be to shop, eat, and spend time there. And the chamber supports uh, the construction of a multi-use arena that would host the New Mexico United. And we absolutely believe it should be located downtown. Kyle, it's so important that we invest in these downtown projects. And on homelessness and crime, we continue to work with the city to construct more overnight sheltering in the core of Albuquerque to provide a place for the homeless to stay and be connected to services and move them out of the downtown area. And just a couple of weeks ago, we sent a letter to the city asking for a second unit of officers to be deployed downtown. That's great, Terry. And I, I know we're in these issues for the long haul. Education, public safety, and downtown transformation. They, they are the keys uh, to a brighter economic future here in Albuquerque. So Terry, tell us how are the other chamber programs uh, that we administer during the course of also administering our bigs going during this COVID environment? Kyle, they're just going great. And they've undergone some changes like everything. Ordinarily, for example, we'd have 300 adult tutors in APS schools right now helping Title I students learn to read as part of our Albuquerque Reads program. Instead, we provided every child we serve at three elementary schools, 20 take home books of their very own, a laptop desk that they can use in their own personal space at home, and a backpack to store their school supplies, books, and papers. We launched an online library of read aloud videos for kids to watch from anywhere called ABQ Reads to You. 
Our highly acclaimed Leadership Albuquerque program just launched as well with an impressive full cohort of 40 professionals. We're doing virtual instruction now with really great speakers and we'll adjust as public health orders allow. And on our New Mexico Roadrunner trips, we put them on hold, but we intend to resume sometime next summer. These are goodwill ambassador trips that we take to other parts of the state twice a year. Thank you, Terry. All important programs. On your screen, uh, we're showing you the Chamber's two publications that we put out each year, our annual, annual legislative summary and our plan of action. You may have received a copy in the mail, but they can also be accessed in flipbook format online. The plan of action covers all of the Chamber's priorities and programs, as well as our leadership and the advantages of joining the Chamber. And let me just say, no, no organization covers what happens at the legislature better than the chamber. Our board passes a comprehensive agenda prior to each session. Uh, every night during the session, the chamber publishes a newsletter that keeps the business community up to date on what's happening in the roundhouse. And then this publication comes out after the session uh, concludes to recap it all. Thanks, Kyle. And finally, the COVID-19 pandemic really has delivered a disruption like no other to local businesses, to our local economy, and to our state finances. Think back to where we were this time last year and to our state finances. Think back to where we were this time of year. Where were you in November of last year? Think, uh, look, things look nothing like they were expected to look just a year ago. The Chamber has adapted and our board stepped in right away to ensure that we would be able to continue providing high quality advocacy and support for businesses at a time when it's needed more than ever before. We promoted the products and services of local businesses and the new ways for people to access them. We've regularly provided information on COVID developments to businesses, helped them navigate public health orders, and guided them to financial assistance. We've regularly provided information on COVID developments to businesses. We published video updates from local leaders tailored to business. We launched a mass, mass campaign statewide and authored an operette about businesses being ready and willing partners. And every level of government, we fought for more business funding, including grant programs at city and county levels, a low interest loan program at a state level, and of course, the important paycheck protection program at the federal level. And rest assured, for how long or ever long we're facing this virus, we intend to be on the front line, working to make it easier for businesses to manage through it and working to stop additional costs and burdens from being placed on them. Kyle, with that, I think we're ready to move forward with our program. I hope we've provided a good uh, glimpse, though brief, into the priorities and work of our chamber. Thank you, Terry. And I echo your comments about the pain this virus has caused many businesses in our city and state. We need strong business advocates in New Mexico more than ever before. And I might add that despite all the struggles and setbacks we've seen over the past nine months, we also have seen incredible kindness, grit, and determination from our people and our businesses to make it and, and to overcome. Okay, with that, let me introduce uh, you to the moderator of today's panel discussion, which we've entitled The Way Back to Health and Work. Bill Maxwell, who everyone knows, is a uh, chamber board mem member. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Presbyterian Healthcare Services. Uh, and prior to becoming CEO, Dale was the executive vice president and chief administrative officer of Presbyterian, overseeing the organization's finances, information technology, data and analytics, and market development and expansion. He holds a master's of healthcare administration from Seton Hall, and a Bachelor of Accountancy from New Mexico State University. Dale, welcome, thank you, and the floor is yours. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Kyle. I'm excited to, uh, to be here today, and congratulations on the great work the Chamber is doing. You, Terry, and the entire Chamber staff, we appreciate having such a skilled, ambitious Chamber representing all of us. 
Today, we're joined by three experts who are involved in various aspects of our nation's response to COVID-19. I hope we can cover a number of topics related to how we move beyond this pandemic and put it behind us, what it will take and what that timeline might be. We'll talk about vaccines, a little bit about treatments, and whether additional federal economic relief is on the horizon. But before we begin, I just want to acknowledge and thank all of our healthcare workers in New Mexico, the heroes, the first responders, who have shown such tremendous courage and sacrifice during this pandemic. They are on the front lines, even at this very moment, battling a brutal enemy and they're saving lives. For their sake, for your sake, and for your loved one's sake, I wanna stress at the outset that this is not a time for COVID fatigue. We need vigilance, mask wearing, distancing, and good public health practices. We really are in this together. Okay, having said that, let's get going. We're happy to have Neil Bradley with us today, Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Neil oversees economic and employment policy, small business policy, health policy, and security policy. He was previously the president of Chartwell Policy Solutions and spent nearly 20 years working in the U.S. House of Representatives, including 11 years for the House Republican leadership. He's a graduate of Georgetown University and a native of Sapulpa, Oklahoma. Hope I said that right, Neil. Welcome. We also Thanks have with us. Got it. <laughs> got, okay, I got it now. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Mike Ibarra, uh, Vice President of Medical Affairs and Strategic Alliances for Pharma. Mike is a board sort of certified emergency physician. Prior to joining Pharma, he chaired the Government and the National Affairs Committee at the American Academy of Emergency Medicine. He continues to serve as a fellowship director for the Health Policy Fellowship at Georgetown. Mike is a graduate of Stanford University and Georgetown University School of Medicine. Mike, I did some research on you and I also understand that you're a school teacher of two kids and that's your, <laughs> that's your new profession, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a school teacher in charge of virtual learning in this household, so. That's, that's right, well, congratulations. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thanks for having me. And we're grateful that Carl Garner is here as well. Carl is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Eli Lilly and Company. He joined Eli Lilly more than 26 years ago, first as a senior scientist in the lab setting. Since then, he has published many scientific articles on his research and has conducted national and international lectures on drug development and regulatory sciences. Dr. Garner holds a bachelor's degree from Auburn University and a master's and PhD from Vanderbilt University. Welcome, Carl. Thanks again to each of you and to our attendees. If you have questions of the panel as we move through our conversation, please type them in the Q&A box on your screen. I'm gonna repeat that, type them in the Q&A box on your screen. And a little later, we'll try to get as many of those questions as possible. So let's jump right in. First question I think I'm gonna throw out to, to, to each of you, and I wanna talk about the, the virus and how it's spreading. As we sit here in New Mexico, uh, we have one of the most stringent state public health orders, I think, in the country. However, when you look across all 50 states, we're seeing record numbers of new cases every single day. Just yesterday, 187,000 across the US. We're seeing new records in deaths. Give me your perspective on what is driving this virus today given that we have different policies driven by different states. Mike, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Dale. Thanks again for having me. It's it's really great to be with you. Um, I mentioned on the pre-call, my brother lives in New Mexico. He's a resident in orthopedics in um, Las Cruces. So he lives there. He has been sharing the public health alerts that he's getting via text about stay-at-home orders and curfews and He's definitely experiencing the, the surge of patients uh, that he's uh, taking care of um, or that he's being impacted by because of, because of the uh, 
you know, ability, whether or not they can do elective surgeries and, and how, um, you know, off service folks like orthopedists might be pulled in to take care of other of COVID cases. So definitely hearing about the situation on the ground there and hoping you all are staying safe. You know, there's a lot of theories as to why this is happening. Um, a couple of unique features about this wave of the pandemic is that where the first wave that kind of, you know, hump that you saw on the chart was largely driven by New York City, and the second wave was driven by some of the Sunbelt states like Florida, Texas, California, um, we're now seeing more of a national epidemic where basically every state in the country is seeing a rise in cases. And so, uh, you know, Clearly, clearly there are things that we need to do, um, but what we've learned in this most recent wave is that small gatherings, informal gatherings are playing a role where people let their guard down perhaps with close friends or family, um, and that's how it's spreading. Um, we always kind of knew that there would be a little bit of seasonality to the virus, where in the winter, um, people tend to be indoors more. Um, the virus does behave differently indoors than it does outdoors. It tends to spread a little bit easier. Um, colder air, there's also a theory about colder air and less humidity, um, allowing the virus to kind of linger in the air a little bit longer. It's a novel virus. There's a lot that we don't know. Uh, the things that we do know, though, are that basic public health measures really work. Um, wa wearing masks, keeping socially distant, um, and using a hand sanitizer or washing your hands frequently. Those are three things that absolutely work. Um, we've implemented them in healthcare settings and been able to really diminish um, the number of cases that we see among healthcare providers, nurses, um, techs. And if we did that on a national scale, we would definitely see the cases go down. Great, thanks for that, Mike. Those are all simple, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's what we learned in, in kindergarten in some ways. Uh, Carl, let me let me turn it over to you and uh, see if you have anything you'd like to add to you know why the virus is, is spreading the way it is today. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, first, thanks for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this discussion. Um, you know, Mike put it pretty well. Uh, uh, this virus is moving in waves. We're seeing the, the big wave now. Um, you know, it it um, it finds the cracks. It finds the light and it um, and it can get through when we least expect it. You started off with a comment around now's not the time to have COVID fatigue. And it's so easy to do that. Um, I was part of um, my daughter's wedding a couple of weeks ago. And um, of course, having spent nine months fighting this disease, I was very vigilant and I bought 250 N95 masks. We social distance everybody, uh, but the virus found a way. And uh, it found a way into my in-laws who were in their eighties um, and they're Native Americans living here in, on an Indian reservation in South Alabama. And even though um, we've been able through the hard work at Eli Lilly and Company to have a therapeutic available that can really keep people out of the hospitals, it was hard to get them access, um, particularly in underserved communities and in ones like the Native American community. Uh, so it, we still have a challenge there and we can't give up because like I said, the, the virus does find the light. And even though, um, probably no one was more diligent than I was, it still found a way. So don't give up and don't get COVID fatigue yet. <laughs> Great, absolutely, good uh, good points. Neil, before, before I toss it to you, I wanna read a quote that, uh, that I read just a few weeks ago uh, related to the pandemic response. You said, we have a choice. Uh, this can be either a light switch or a dial. Maybe as you answer this question, why don't you, uh, talk about that uh, that statement that you made. Yeah, thanks, Dale, and, and uh, let me just echo. It's such a pleasure to be with you and uh, with our friends at the the Greater Albuquerque Chamber at the U.S. Chamber. Uh, we're pleased to call uh, you all partners and friends, um, and we appreciate the opportunity to, to work together on so many important issues, and perhaps none more important than this pandemic and, and the economic fallout from it. Um, yeah, when, when I was referencing um, a switch or a dial, it really is about this idea of, of vigilance, right? None of us want, there's all this talk of lockdowns and, um, you know, are we going to return to lockdowns? None of us want to return to lockdowns, uh, but there are choices to be made here. And it's choices that we make individually and as a community and as larger communities about what we're willing to do to control the spread of this. And if we get in front of it, we're able to treat this as a dial. We're implementing the common sense public health measures um, that, that Mike talked about. Um, if for some reason we're unwilling to turn that dial, if we're unwilling to make those modest incremental adjustments, uh, then you get to a point in which 
uh, the only responsible public health uh, measure that you can take is more like a light switch. And that's the point all of us want to avoid. And so if given a choice between the light switch and a dial, let's pursue the dial. Let's take the incremental targeted steps. And if we do those well and responsibly, we never have to answer the question of whether or not we should we should flip the switch on the economy. Right. So we could possibly do the dial if we follow three easy steps that uh, Dr. Ibarra is talking about. Right. It's 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 it has to be kind of both. Well, great. Thank you for the three three of you and your response. Uh, this one, Mike, I'm going I'm to toss to you. Uh, being a physician, emergency physician, uh, you know, if you if you go back to March, April, May, early on in the pandemic, uh, versus where we are today, how much better are we today at treating uh, COVID nineteen, uh, and and what would you attribute that to? Well, um, you know, we're actually we're a lot better at treating it today than we were back in March. Um, and, and, you know, there's things that we assumed about this virus that were just wrong. And there are things that we've learned since then that have improved the treatment. So certainly the our ability to treat people has gotten better. Still too far, far too many people are dying. So I, I don't want folks to think like, it, you know, it'll be totally fine if, if I get it. Um, we still are having too many deaths. Um, so there's there's <laughs> things that we need to unlock about the virus. Um, but there have been a variety of treatment advances, and I think about things in buckets, and I definitely want Carl to talk about the exciting news in his bucket, but we have um, you know, antivirals, meaning medicines that directly attack the virus. Um, you've got antibodies that I'll toss to Carl in just a second. Um, you've got anti-inflammatories, also an area that Carl can talk about, um, but anti-inflammatories are used kind of later phases of the disease. In the early phase of the disease, you attack the virus itself, and then later on when people are very, very sick, the virus has kind of done its damage. And then typically it's the immune system being overactive that's causing the, the body to experience serious damage. And that's why people kind of are in the hospital for a very long time because of that second wave. So if we can control the immune system, then we can sometimes help patients recover. And then there's other uh, medicines that we use like blood thinners or anticoagulants. For some reason, uh, this virus tends to cause clotting in some patients. Um, so that's why people get uh, blood clots in their lungs. Some present with stroke. Actually, it's a it's a really wide spectrum of illness. Um, and then some people also get bacterial infections. So you have antibiotics. So there's kind of five areas that we're looking at as an industry and really contributing both new medicines that have been invented. Gilead invented a medicine called remdesivir that that didn't have a purpose up until this point, and it's now the first FDA approved medicine to to treat um, COVID nineteen. Uh, and then there are other repurposed medicines. So this might be a good segue to Carl to talk about those buckets that I kind of previewed the uh, antibodies and the uh, uh, anti-inflammatories. Yeah, let me go to Carl here in just a second. Just one question for you, Mike. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, the, mor the mortality rate, uh, you know, looks better versus the first, uh, the first spike of the virus. Uh, is that due to treatment or is that due to the demographics of the population? Well, I think we're doing a better job of, of treating people, certainly. So there's a combination of things. Um, it's really hard to tell because, you know, we probably were, you know, really underdiagnosing uh, the virus early on. So we don't really have a good apples to apples comparison of the first wave to this wave. We are doing better at testing. Um, but as the positivity rates creep up, that's why we kind of pay attention to that number. Um, the way I kind of think of it is the higher the positivity rate, the less of the iceberg you're seeing. If the positivity rate is really high, you're probably just seeing the tip of the iceberg. If the positivity rate is really low, then you're probably kind of seeing everything. You're seeing not just the tip, but how much disease is kind of under the water. So as we let the positivity rates creep up, it doesn't really matter if we're doing more testing. You need to test so much that you drive the positivity rate down and you can really understand how widespread the virus is. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have great apples to apples comparisons. Uh, we are getting better. I think mortality rates probably have gone down, uh, but we're still seeing a lot of infection. And so a lot of folks are still dying every day from the virus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Carl, let, let's go to you and let's talk about uh, Eli Lilly and, uh, you know, just a week or a little bit longer, uh, the FDA granted emergency authorization, authorization of your antibody uh, treatment, um, famlinibad. We call it the Batman drug in, in New Mexico because we just can't say that, that, that big word. But why don't you talk to us about uh, that particular antibiotic uh, treatment and any others that you see coming down the pipeline? Sure. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. So maybe I'll start with a little bit of framing around the antibody treatments. The antibody treatments are, are, are designed really to serve as a bridge until we get widespread use of an effective vaccine, which appears to be very close 
and we're all hopeful for that. But in the meanwhile, um, several companies, including Lilly, are, are working on humanized or fully human monoclonal antibodies. These are protein drug products that are administered through infusions. And what these antibodies do is they bind to the virus and they block the virus from entering into human cells, um, and particularly in, in the human cells in the lung, uh, where this particular receptor has high, very high expression, and that's why this presents oftentimes as a pulmonary disease. And so there's several companies working on that. The, these antibodies are, are identified, actually, ours in particular, are from patients that have recovered from COVID-19 disease. And so their body created these antibodies naturally. We identified uh, the most potent of those and, uh, and took actually the best one in the clinical testing. And then in parallel, at risk invested in manufacturing, and this is really unprecedented across the industry in terms of risk, but I think this was a very unique and unprecedented time and called for that. And so uh, we were fortunate in that this drug showed substantial benefit um, in a number of areas in terms of blocking the virus, decreasing symptoms, and then decreasing hospitalizations. So with that information from a randomized controlled clinical trial, the FDA considered that data and uh, authorized emergency use. So it's not been determined to be safe and effective. It doesn't have that full approval of a drug, but uh, the evidence was good enough to show that the potential benefits outweigh uh, the known and potential risk. And so now it's available. Uh, it's in limited supply, but it's going out um, to, to all the states right now. And uh, we're trying to help physicians understand that it is available, how to get it, how to administer it, who it should go to. So we're, you know, we're, we're very deep into that. And there's a huge national effort right now from the U.S. government um, pushing really hard to help uh, ensure uptake of this drug that can block people from going into hospitals, particularly these high risk patients. That's on the right. early end, um, you know, and Mike mentioned kind of the later end uh, where this becomes more of an immunological disease where your immune system is overactive. And yesterday, the FDA uh, provided emergency use authorization for another little drug called um, baricitinib, but it's already on the market for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. It's a strong, potent anti-inflammatory drug branded Illumiant. Uh, but they approved the authorization yesterday for use in COVID patients that are in the hospital that, um, that need therapy to help decrease the immune response so they don't move to more advanced stages of the disease. So that's kind of the two buckets. Great. Carl, can we anticipate that we will continue to see uh, you know, pharmaceuticals like this uh, introduced as we, uh, as we battle this virus? You will. Uh, Regeneron has one that's being reviewed right now uh, by the FDA that could have authorization at, at any time, as far as I know. Uh, that'll give us two options, and um, they both are, are going to work fine. Uh, the data show that. The key is getting it uh, manufactured, is supplied out to the states, and then used. Um, that's what we're finding is a barrier right now. We're able to get it out to the states and allocate it to the states. We're going to manufacture over the next uh, few weeks, almost a million doses that would be available in the U.S. Um, but we're, we're learning a week and a half into this now, or almost two weeks into this now, that it's not that easy to get it to the states and to the hospitals and the hospitals to use it. So we've got a ways to go there. Uh, this will be a bridge to the vaccines. Um, and then the vaccines, I think, will be the tipping point for us to be able to look at when we can really get our employees back in the workforce. Yeah, let's let's pivot and talk about the vaccine. Um, you know, the vaccine is one thing. The importance is really the vaccination. Uh, that's what, that's what we need is for individuals to be to be vaccinated. But let's talk about the vaccine first. Uh, you know, we've all seen and been tied to to the news uh, postings about uh, these vaccines coming out, Pfizer, Moderna, um, and of course. Where do our thoughts go? You know, there's a vaccine. We're all going back to normal. We're going to start hugging and meeting in person. Uh, it's probably not the case uh, in the in the short term. Uh, but let's kind of this is kind of step back, talk about the vaccine. Mike, I'll start with you. What do we know about these vaccines? What um, you know? What are some of the positive aspects? And what are some of the things that you think um, as a community we need to know about those vaccines? 
Sure. Well, um, there are a variety of companies that are investigating uh, several approaches. You've probably heard of the leading uh, companies right now, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, J&J. And you probably know their names because they've been talked about in the news as being close, you know, fairly close uh, to, to either applying or getting authorization or finishing their trial. It's important to know, though, that there are actually hundreds of clinical trials going on right now for vaccines involving multiple companies looking at a variety of different approaches. And the thing that I've probably had to talk to my friends and family about most is the concern that you can get get the coronavirus from the vaccine. And I guess it's just important to start there that these vaccines do not make you sick with the coronavirus. Um, they will have side effects, um, like all medicines have side effects, and they're being studied and reported, and that's why we do clinical trials. Um, but the idea with vaccination is to is not to make you sick with coronavirus, it's to show you enough of the virus to make your body recognize it if you ever do come in contact with it. So I think that's the most important thing to know. Um, Pfizer and Moderna are very far along. Pfizer today said that they're going to apply for an emergency use authorization. They're both using a technique called mRNA. And this is a really new innovative technique. And the, the data is really positive. Um, what both have said is that their vaccine is 95 or roughly 90, 95% effective. Um, five One group got vaccine, the other group got placebo. Um, and, uh, you know, they just waited to see how many folks got, got sick. And uh, I think in their press release, they indicated about 170 people got coronavirus um, and 164 of them were in the uh, control group, meaning they got the saline, not the vaccine. Um, so that's how they came up with that 95% efficacy. And so I think that's really exciting. Uh, and that's the thing that I guess is the most positive aspect uh, is how effective they are. The flu shot by comparison is about 40 to 60% effective. And then childhood vaccines like MMR, chicken pox, those are in the 80 to 90%. So we're at really high efficacy rates um, based on the data that's been released. Um, and so that's what I've really been leading with, with my friends and family, what they should know is that uh, the clinical trials are large. They're as large as any other clinical trial. They're following patients for two months um, after getting the second shot. So they know kind of what the side effects are. And then the data so far that we've heard about is really positive. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I'm addressing the vaccine confidence issues in my network. And um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of other questions though. Yeah, exactly. There'll probably be some more as we open it up, but uh, you're, you know, you're right. They're effective and they're safe. Carl, maybe touch on um, what are some of the challenges uh, that we have with at least those two front runner uh, vaccines? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge is, is manufacturing, yeah. um, making enough doses. Un unlike the vaccines that are giving in pretty small quantities, these um, antibodies require high milligrams to low gram quantities. And so it, it takes a lot of manufacturing capacity to do that. And so the industries come together, sharing the resources, for example, even with ours, um, Amgen has, has um, partnered with us to ma help manufacture the antibody because they have large capacity to do that. We're using manufacturing capabilities all around the world to be able to manufacture this and get it, get it made and distributed. That's first. Uh, the second one is uh, making sure that the healthcare system is ready to utilize these therapies. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they're, they're given by intravenous administration. And most drugs that are given by IV route are given in um, infusion clinics or in hospital settings. And infusion clinics largely are there to serve cancer patients and patients with other chronic illnesses. It's not a place you wanna be bringing COVID into. So there's a real challenge there. Uh, there's an effort going on right now, and I know um, the state of New Mexico is actually playing a significant role in piloting and driving some of these, and that is setting up central infusion centers, emergency infusion centers, with collaborations with the state, local governments, and the hospital systems. I think that's going to be key to, to access. It doesn't do us any good to ship out material to states where it's sitting in the refrigerator. So we've got to get that administration. So making it is one, and making sure patients can get it administered is two. Yeah, that distribution is key, and uh, we know that uh, at least those first two, you know, take a, a booster 21 to 28 days later, and so uh, a lot of complexities in, in how you you uh, uh, push that through the channels. Neil, I want to I want to go to you and talk to you about about that. So there's been a there was a recent uh, Harris poll uh, just from a couple of weeks ago, and it found that about one in three respondents said they would not take the vaccine 
even if it were found to be 75 to 90% effective. So how do you think about that? What role does the US chamber play in that? What does the Albuquerque chamber play in that? And what do we as individual business leaders play in gaining that confidence or as Dr. Ibarra said, an effective, a safe vaccine that will return us back to normal quicker. Yeah, uh, those numbers are disturbing, the, the full numbers that, that you referenced. We, we all, there's always a subgroup of, of individuals in society who have concerns about uh, vaccinations, uh, whether that's the annual flu vaccine that, that people um, uh, just just don't want to get, or you know, increasingly as we've seen in recent years, even uh, childhood immunizations um, with really con- you know deadly consequences uh, when when we don't have high levels of, of vaccination. Listen, I think the the important role that um, the U.S. Chamber, the Albuquerque Chamber, that other leaders in communities, and frankly, all of us as individuals. Is that we have to we have to become educated. You know, um, we have to um, trust science. We have to trust the data. We ought to be informed consumers. Uh, we ought to be responsible members of our community. And so, as we think about, in the same way that as we approached, you know, this this winter season, we were encouraging our members, our companies at the U.S. Chamber to uh, become facilitators and informers for your employees to get the annual flu shot. Because we knew that in the midst of the, this, this new wave of COVID, we didn't want further confusion with people declining flu shots and a rampant normal flu season. In the same way, once we get to the point of the vaccine, uh, being a source for information, pointing employees, uh, employ- pointing friends in the right direction for information, uh, and being trusted advisors is going to be a, a key point in building confidence. Yeah, thanks for that, Neil. Um, I'm, a, I'm going to put the three of you a little bit on the spot, and, and uh, I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. Um, so what is your best estimate of when we will be able to return to a normal state. So I think what we're looking for in order to do that is we need about a 60% immunity in the population. The vaccine is key to that, D- distribution is key to that. So in your best crystal ball, and uh, Nick, I'm gonna, or Neil, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, when, when can we get back to doing what we love to do and getting back to business? Well, Mike my, my and Carl will have a better sense of the exact timing of that. But I'll tell you this, uh, it's going to be further away than any of us want. And, and I, what I'm fearful of is further away than what we anticipate. And so the real danger in this moment that we're entering into, and it's a hopeful moment, right? That we, we should be hopeful. The, the, this news of the vaccines is fabulous. It's, it's what we've wanted to hear all along. But we're not going to reach that 60% for a while. And if we let our guard down in the midst of reaching that 60% on the assumption that it's just around the corner, that it's a week away, that it's a month away, that you know by the time we hit the new year, um, we have uh, a real risk that we infect a lot of people, that we cause a lot of illnesses, and we cause a lot of unnecessary deaths. So I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly when. I'm just going to tell you that we got to keep our guard up until yeah. we reach that. Yeah, it really gets back to your switch and your dial, right? We're not flipping a switch, uh, you know, on January 3rd, we still have that dial. Dr. Ibarra, I saw you smiling when I, uh, when I asked that question. Uh, you know, your scientific brain, uh, what do you think? Well, I, I agree with Neil that it's not gonna be as soon as we, we want it to be. Uh, we, don't, we want it to be at the end of December once, uh, you know, once we're kind of hearing that the FDA is gonna look at the data from these vaccines. Uh, the government has said that they're ready to start distributing it 24 hours after uh, authorization. Um, so things will move quickly, um, but it really depends on how comfortable people are getting the vaccine. Um, and so that's why I think it's really important to talk about the issues that we've been talking about, which are the vaccine confidence. Um, so you do need to reach a certain percentage of the population. Um, the other component of it is what does normal mean, right? Um, I mean, normal for me would be able to do things that I used to do. And I, I accept and I'm fine with continuing some of the public health measures that we've gotten used to. Um, but I think other, you know, other folks are not as comfortable wearing a mask or you know, doing things with a little bit of distance and hand washing. Um, so 
I, I think it's, you know, normal is a really loaded term. I think what does the new normal look like? How can we feel comfortable doing things um, with, with some level of protection? I hope to be able to have, uh, you know, more activities for my kids, have them back in school, um, for example, have them do, you know, the things that we used to do uh, starting next year. Um, but that really does depend on on how com how, how many people get vaccinated, um, how quickly folks are willing to get vaccinated, and, and what kind of combination of those public health measures are we willing to keep. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, Carl? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add to that, um, other than, you know, if you look at what the manufacturers are saying in terms of the supply in the U.S., the, the U.S. government's in a really good position to get this distributed out fast. They're learning it right now with the monoclones. They're going to use that same model, by the way, they, they developed it with remdesivir. So it's maturing out, um, but it's going to be a public policy play as well. Right, we've got to get people to, to um, trust the scientists and trust the decision makers, trust the FDA and their review. I can assure you from going through this uh, emergency use authorization review for our monoclonal, the FDA is not cutting any corners. Um, they're working very hard. They're asking more questions to our scientists and our physicians on our application than they do on full applications for other drugs that we've done. So they are doing their best. They're doing what they've been called to do, and that's what they're built for. So the, or, the, the country, uh, as a matter of policy, needs to trust the scientists put in place to make decisions like this. And then once they're made, we need to distribute them and, and encourage people to to move forward with uh, immunizations. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for, for all three. I didn't, didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you know, it's a question we all get. And I think it's an important discussion for us to have because I think all of you said it, uh, we'd like to get back you know, to a safe mm -hmm. place um, sooner rather than later. But I think it's important for us to understand the challenges of uh, manufacturing, challenges of distribution, challenges of people uh, you know feeling comfortable to take this and it's going to take longer than than what we uh, than what we would like so with that Neil um, how, you know what are you seeing um, on the second round of a paycheck uh, protection program these businesses are struggling today uh, probably will continue to, to be in this dial mode for a period of time um, what are your thoughts about a second round of uh, of paycheck protection? You know, um, if we were doing this event a, a week and a half ago, I would have told you that um, my optimism was was increasing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we were all disappointed, you know, from June uh, until the, the end of October when Congress should have been uh, passing a new bill, reauthorizing the Paycheck Protection Program, reauthorizing the other support for small businesses and for individuals and families who are uh, found themselves unemployed, um, as, as millions have as a result of this pandemic. Um, we were disappointed that they didn't get it done then, uh, but we recognized it was an election season. The election, um, we, 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 had, we had our election. Um, there was a lot of initial momentum in the days after the election from both Republicans and Democrats in Washington uh, to bridge their differences. Um, we always contended at the U.S. Chamber that the differences between the parties um, were actually a lot smaller than what you would think if you listened to each of them. Um, listening to them independently, they were describing gargantuan differences um, and, uh, that would lead you to believe that they, they couldn't reach agreement. We've always found that the differences, once you actually commit to paper, the policies that both sides say they support uh, were much smaller. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're in a... a perhaps historically unique post-election time um, uh, for our country. And the, the hope that was experienced a week and a half ago is quickly fading. Um, I think the one thing that can push Congress to act, and I hope folks who are, who are joining us today, if you have the opportunity to talk to your member of Congress, to talk to your senator, uh, that the point you make to them that, that there's nothing to be gained by waiting. The only thing gained by waiting is more small business closures, more families who face eviction, foreclosure, inability to pay the utility bills um, in terms of getting a bill done. Post-January, we're still going to have divided government, which means Republicans and Democrats are still going to have to come together to do a deal. So do the deal now, and you get the added benefit of saving some of those small businesses and helping those families in the midst of the holiday season. 
And if you fail to do that, we know what's going to happen. We've seen the percentages, about a quarter of businesses that say within the next two to three months, they face permanent closure. We know that there are 9 million Americans who would be kicked off uh, their current unemployment, not have it reduced, kicked off of it the day after Christmas. No one wants that to happen. So let's not let it happen. And, you know, so um, uh, my, my answer to your question is more of a call to arms uh, for folks to reach out to their lawmakers and say, uh, it's up to you, get this job done and don't delay. Yeah, thanks for that, Neil. You know, this there's uh, never been a better time for us to do the right thing. Just simply do the right thing for the condition that we're in today. Well, Kyle, that does it for the questions I have for our panelists today. Yeah, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Kyle, do you have any questions from the audience? Yes, I do, Dale, and thank you. Uh, just a, a great, great job by you as the moderator and, and by the panelists. Just, a, in my opinion, a world-class conversation, very sobering, poignant, matter of fact, without a lot of the political rhetoric, rhetoric that you see in these types of conversations. But uh, really well done. We do have uh, two questions from the audience, and I'll just remind the audience that uh, uh, if you have a question, uh, go into the Q&A box on your screen and type that in, and, and we'll try to get to it. But uh, first question uh, is from Bruce Stidworthy, board member on the, on the chamber board. How long are these vaccines expected to be effective? Is it likely to be like the flu shot uh, that you have to get every year or more like most other vaccines that last many years or even a lifetime? Carl, you want to tackle that one? Uh, well, I'll give you my answer. And Mike, uh, I think you probably have even more insight here. I think it's the hope, the way these are engineered and designed, that they would um, infer a protracted immunity to the to this virus. Um, it's one of the reasons why you're getting the booster shot to make sure that you, you have a very robust and sustained immune response. Um, but time will tell, we'll have to gather that evidence. And then we'll also have to make sure that the virus itself doesn't change. So it's, uh, it's important that not only we gather the evidence, but also we, we take what we've learned here and be ready for the next um, emergency that could come. Yeah. Mike, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, it's a novel virus. So, you know, we, we don't really have, we don't have long-term data on immunity. Uh, we do know that people are immune to the virus and they, they get immunity from the vaccine. Uh, it's just going to take a matter of time to see how long it lasts for. Um, the flu vaccine is a little different though, because what the flu vaccine is doing is actually inoculating you against different strains of the flu, the ones that we think are going to be predominant, like the three to four that are going to be common that year. So it's kind of more of a guessing game. In this case, you know, this is the coronavirus, COVID-19. It's one of the coronaviruses. There are other coronaviruses that aren't pandemic strains. So this one, we're just targeting the, the COVID-19, you know, version of a coronavirus. And, uh, you know, whether or not it mutates a lot could impact things, but it's not like the flu vaccine where you're actually getting different strains of flu um, that kind of circulate. So a little bit of a different, different problem that we're trying to solve. Okay. Then uh, a question from uh, Kat Powdrell. And this relates, I think, to the uh, to the clinical tests by uh, Moderna and Pfizer, and and it relates to the five percent that the vaccines were not successful on, and or five or six or two or whatever the percentage is. But has there been any discussion about what the commonalities uh, there were among uh, the two percent in trials that weren't affected by the vaccine? That's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. I think that's that's probably what the FDA will look at and probably medical journals as well. Um, what I've seen is just kind of top line data. I have not seen anything kind of in more detail. The one thing that I did take away from one of the press releases, I think it was Moderna's, is that all the severe cases of COVID-19 that they had in their trial, they were all in the placebo group. So it's possible that, you know, of the six people in the Moderna trial that got vaccine, but also got sick. It could have been a more mild form. Um, I mean, it's certainly none of those folks got the severe form in the Moderna trial. So there's some inferences you can make, um, but I think we kind of have to wait for the full data to come out to really understand um, what the, you know, what the differences might have been um, for those individuals as opposed to the folks that got placebo um, or folks that got uh, the other folks that got the vaccine. Kyle, well, I might, I might add it if I could that you know, in, in any population this large, you're, you're gonna have a, a very diverse group of 
individuals in the trial. And there are a number of conditions that drive to uh, having a lower ability to mount an immune response like age or comorbid conditions or underlying immunological diseases. So again, I've not seen the individual data, but it wouldn't surprise me if that small group of people that didn't respond, um, that there'll be a reason why they didn't, such as um, immune, immune deficiencies. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, this next question uh, comes from Claudia Sanchez, and I think you all, uh, you all three touched on it, but uh, uh, there's distrust in the community about the vaccine due to its ex expedited approval. Uh, should the community be concerned? And is there any way to put us at ease? <laughs> I'm happy to start. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention this before. I'm actually in one of the trials. I'm in the Moderna trial. Um, and I uh, definitely understand why people feel nervous because I felt nervous. Um, you know, I was excited to sign up, but then I was sitting in the waiting room at University of Maryland waiting to get my shot. And I actually like, I, you know, I got nervous. I was like, gosh, this is, this is not an everyday occurrence. Um, so I totally get it. Um, at the same time, the clinical trials are large. These are 30 to 40,000 people, which is what you would expect from a normal uh, kind of non-pandemic non testing of a, of a vaccine. So huge number of people that are in the trials and they're being followed. Um, the FDA required two months of safety data before they could submit for authorization. Um, so two months is really, um, most reactions to medicines happen when you're giving them or within a few hours or days. Um, so I think that's, you know, kind of a key thing as well. So, so the large kind of safety things that people think about, you know, probably show up in that initial data, um, data set. So no steps are being cut. Um, no steps are being skipped, I guess I should say. Um, you know, it's moving quickly because we had thousands of people volunteer for the trial so they can enroll really fast. And then it's unfortunate, but we have so much disease, uh, so much coronavirus in this country that, you know, you could get to a large number of people in the trials really fast. Um, they, they, they were able to get high numbers because there's a lot of virus floating around. Um, so we got an answer really quickly because we have spread um, of the virus. So that's my take on it. And uh, as a clinical trial participant, I feel really, really confident and happy to be able to participate. Good. Okay. Thank you all. That's, Dale, that's it for the uh, questions from the audience. Um, I don't know how you might feel as the moderator being put on the spot, but <laughs> I might, uh, in your in your uh, role and capacity as CEO there at Presbyterian Healthcare, uh, I mean, we've seen the numbers spike here in New Mexico, and, and I know the concerns have been about uh, hospital capacities and hospital staffing and, uh, and that sort of thing. Can you just comment uh, about what that looks like here, here locally? Yeah, here locally we are in a we are in a tough place. I'm, I'm just going to be straight up transparent with you. Uh, yesterday uh, in the state we had almost 800 hospitalized with with COVID. Uh, Carl, Mike, Neil, you might not think that's a that's a big number, but you're talking to a state that uh, has uh, really the, I think one of the lowest bed per capita in, in the across the country. So we didn't have a whole lot of headroom to, to start with. Uh, as of today, uh, I think most of the hospitals, close to 100% of them are running at or above capacity. Uh, the health orders put in place last week uh, are good. I support them, they are needed, uh, but it will take about two weeks, uh, in my opinion, to see our positive case numbers begin to flatten out and hopefully um, decrease at that time. So I am very concerned for the next two weeks um, with the number of cases that have been reported, uh, yesterday being our highest day at 3,675, I believe. Uh, there's a few little you know, things in that number, but we're still you know, 2,000 to 2,500 cases a day. Those will turn into hospitalizations. They will turn into, into deaths, you know, unfortunately. So, you know, as a healthcare uh, organization and, and as part of the industry in New Mexico, we're all working together. UNM, Loveless, Presbyterian, the state of New Mexico uh, has come together to fight this uh, in, in, in a really proactive, uh, collaborative way. So I'm, I'm proud of that. We're going to have to find ways to expand uh, and we're going to have to find ways to uh, bring in additional staff uh, into the state. Staffing is, is really probably our biggest issue. Uh, in uh, in creating and filling that capacity. So, uh, Kyle, I hope that was uh, not too 
much of a downer on a Friday afternoon, but uh, we have we have a couple of dark weeks ahead of us. Yeah, well, bless you and, and the team there at Presbyterian, UNMH, Loveless. I mean, uh, uh, sincere appreciation to everyone on the front lines that are uh, they're fighting it, putting the long hours in, stressing over it. And I mean, it's sincerely appreciated. And our prayers are are with you as we all work to to manage the capacities. Well, um, great. Ed, Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. Thanks to our attendees for, for your thoughtful questions as well. Um, uh, you know, Neil, Mike, Carl, uh, you've been fantastic. Uh, you've been experts. Thank you for spending so much time, you know, talking with us today. Uh, I know I learned a great deal. Uh, I know our community learned a great deal. Uh, each of your fields, we wish you the very best as you go forward. And when we've moved past this pandemic, we hope that uh, maybe you can make it out to our beautiful state of New Mexico and, and uh, together safely, we can uh, share our red and green chili. So Kyle, back to you. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And Dale, if you don't mind, we had one other question that I think is a great question. It, it shouldn't take long to answer. Uh, if, if one of you panelists wouldn't mind taking that on, another one from Bruce Stead, Stedworthy, and that is, what is the latest data on how long a person is immune after recovering from COVID-19? Do uh, any of, of you have a, an idea of that? I mean, Mike, uh, maybe I'll, I'll comment here and you can chime in. Uh, the data I've seen, um, people are mounting really good um, uh, immune responses, creating lots of antibodies that are very potent and selective against the antibody that seem to be lasting for months. So I'm pretty optimistic from the data I've seen that uh, if you've gotten the disease that you are going to mount immunity to it and be protected for some period of time. Um, but that's just the data I've seen to date. And Mike, have you seen anything different? No, I agree. It's it's just a matter of uh, we just need more time, you know, to see how long this immunity lasts for. We know you get immune to it. Um, for some reason, though, people that have kind of mild infections can get reinfected. There's been a few case reports of that. But, you know, it's just going to take more time to figure out how long the immunity lasts. It's only been around. It's it's probably only been on this planet for about a year. So we just don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, my appreciation to, to the three of you for uh, spending some time with us here in, in Albuquerque. And Dale, again, uh, great job. And I know you are up against it with everything going on out there. So thank you for taking an hour and a half out of your day to day to do that. Um, and I'll remind our audience that this uh, this call is being recorded. And uh, as we've done with our, our other uh, calls this year in the virtual environment, we will make that recording uh, available to uh, all of you in the audience. Uh, you'll be getting a, a link from the chamber uh, with, with the link to that recording. So thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, I think you know you can always count on the chamber to provide timely and important information about uh, the issues that matter the most uh, to the health of our economy and the well-being of our state. Uh, again, I want to make a quick note uh, to express our appreciation to those who have sponsored today's meeting, PNM, New Mexico Mutual, Bank of Albuquerque, UNM, Western Sky, CNM, Molina, Presbyterian, Excellent Schools New Mexico, Albertsons, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Comcast, Sandia Laboratory, uh, Federal Credit Union, True Health New Mexico, Jane's, Pattern Energy, U.S. Bank, Bohannon Houston, KPMG, General Mills, Payday HCM, Loveless Biomedical, and New Mexico Bank and Trust. Terry, that's a mouthful. We appreciate our great sponsors, but it points to the uh, significant support that our chamber uh, has always had from our business community here in Albuquerque. Of course, we've got some more uh, great fall events uh, coming up. Uh, tell us about those. Yes, Kyle, we do. We hope everyone can make our next two events. The first is our public safety signature event, our third annual Quinestat briefing with District Attorney Raul Torres. It's on December 3rd from 10 to 1, 1130. And I promise you, you won't want to miss it. 
DA Taurus will provide an update on crime trends in our community and discuss a number of important community justice issues and his plan for reducing crime. Also, the second event is our Business Beat Speaker Series will be held on December 15 from 2 to 3. We'll have Legislative Finance Committee uh, Director David Abbey with us to give us the very latest information on our state's finances and economic recovery. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you, Terry. And registration is open now for those great events. I hope you all can join us for those. Uh, I want to express a big thanks to, to Alliance Audiovisual for their assistance with today's meeting. Um, on behalf of Terry, the Chamber staff, uh, our many partners, and our Board of Directors, it is an honor to represent and work on behalf of Albuquerque's business community. Together, let's keep building a, a greater Albuquerque. So with that, I just wish everyone stay safe, healthy, and see you soon.